together, uh, Lord's Supper, you know, just coming together and all having our minds on similar things. And we started this year so far as our theme being the gospel of King Jesus. And what we want to look at today, and I kind of brought up a little bit last week, is one of the number one titles that Jesus is called is Jesus the Christ. A lot of times it will be shortened into Jesus Christ. And, you know, as I know you all know, but some of you may not, it's not always apparent, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a title. He is Jesus the Christ. If you were to actually call him by his name, it would be either Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And so this title means something, and it ought to mean something. But we don't go around using the word Christ a whole lot, do we? Um, other than in reference to Jesus. So what we're going to be looking at this morning is what does that word mean? What significance did it have to the first century church? What Old Testament significance did it have? And why should we care? Okay? So let's look first. Um, let's go to Acts chapter 18. I know it was read for us this morning. But let's go there for a minute. Acts chapter 18, if you have your Bibles. <clears throat> and we're going to read it again in a little bit. But I just want us to kind of understand what's going on. So after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And so what we're getting out of Paul is every single Sabbath, he is going, that's the first place he always goes, isn't it? He enters into a new place, he enters into a new city, he goes and he talks to the Jews, because the Jews already have a lineage and an expectation of the coming Christ. And so what we're looking at is how is he reasoning with them? What is he using to reason with them that Jesus is the Christ? And this is actually where a lot of what we call prophecy comes in. There were prophecies that were made many hundreds of years before in the Old Testament, that there would be this figure, this person who would come, who would be the Christ. Now, if you're a Jew, the word Christ, you know, a Greek Jew would use the word Christ, but if you were, you know, a, a Hebrew before the time of the Hellenization of the world, meaning where Alexander the Great came and basically made everybody a Greek, right, and made it the, the national language or the world language, right, and changed everything, the word you would have associated this figure with is not Christ, but Messiah, okay, Messiah. Now, in the Hebrew, the word to anoint is masha. You would masha somebody. And once they were mashad, they would have become a Messiah, Messiah, okay? And so it's literally, to take oil, what they would do is they would use oil, and they would anoint somebody for some specific reason, and the process of anointing is Basha. And once you have become anointed, you are now a Mashiach, or a Messiah. So, but when we hear the word Messiah, we only think of one person, don't we? In the Old Testament, there were many messiahs. Anybody and anything that was anointed became a messiah. A priest who was anointed was a messiah. A king who was anointed was a messiah. There were prophets who would be set apart for God to go on a special mission, and you would anoint them before they would go and they would have become Messiah. Even in the New Testament, 
we have elders coming around and anointing people and sending them, they would have technically become Messiah. So, and the reason I bring all of that up is because, well, of course Jesus is a Messiah. He's an anointed one. What, does, what difference does that make? There were many Messiahs. Well, when you study your Old Testament, you need to understand that Revelation becomes, um, first of all, Revelation becomes more in the sense of God reveals more and more and more as he goes. But also there are certain terms that become more and more specific. As you start reading your Old Testament, when really only kings and prophets are really anointed towards the end of the Old Testament, there is a looking forward to a person who would be the anointed. Not just a anointed figure, but he would be the anointed. And he would be the last Messiah. Meaning, he would be the last Savior Christ figure who would come from God and save Israel. That's what they were waiting for. So, and the reason I bring some of this stuff up is because a lot of times we talk about the Jews. And we talk about the first century Jews. And they were waiting for a Messiah, right? And we, we always kind of bring up the fact, well, they were, waiting, they were waiting for the wrong kind of Messiah. They were waiting for a king to come and ride on his horse and destroy the world. You know where they get that from, right? That's from the Old Testament. Now, they misunderstood exactly how the Messiah would come and to defeat the world and overcome the world. But the exact kind of Messiah they were looking for, a kingly Messiah who would sit on the throne of David, is exactly the Messiah who Jesus came to be, just not in the way they expected. Okay, so they were looking for the right kind of Messiah. They just didn't fully comprehend. And I don't think they really could have. I don't think we really would have understood just by using our Old Testaments, not knowing anything of what Jesus came and did, we would have expected the same kinds of things if you were relying on their same kinds of prophecies. Now, when you get into the New Testament in the Greek, the word to anoint is creo. The word one who's been anointed is Christos, right? The Christos is what we use, but many people given that title. And there's also, this is where we actually get our term Messiah from. Because Old Testament, they use the word anointed, Mashiach. Where does the word Messiah come from? It actually comes from a transliteration of the Greek and the Aramaic, and it's only used twice in Scripture, and we're going to use it. It's Messiahs. It's where we now use the word Messiah. Okay, there's your history lesson on the word Messiah. Here's a couple places it's used, just, just so you can kind of get an idea. In Exodus chapter 40, when they are establishing the tabernacle, okay, and they're, they're, they're uh, bringing in all the different instruments that would be in the tabernacle, they're anointing the priest, but they're also anointing the tabernacle itself, which is where the dwelling place of God would be. So it says, then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. And there's the significant part. A person who's been anointed by God is someone who God is making holy. And the word holy is to set apart for God's own purpose, okay? Someone who was set apart for God. So a person who's anointed is somebody who's been made holy or an object, and they are now used for God. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 14, this is so significant. Remember when Saul, King Saul died? Remember when, first of all, do you remember when King Saul was in a cave? He had to use the potty, right? David was in that same cave. And David, who was on the run from King Saul, was, had already been anointed as the next king by God. And David realized that this title, when it's given to somebody, is so serious that when his little entourage said, hey, Saul's using the bathroom, he doesn't know we're here, this would be a good place to kill him. What does David say? 
Shall I lay a hand against the Lord's anointed? When somebody is anointed, they belong to whom? They are the Lord's. It's a special title. Okay? And in 2 Samuel chapter 1, remember when King Saul dies, and there's this guy who runs by, and he sees that King Saul's died, and there's kind of a, at the end of Samuel, it looks as if he killed Saul. Um, did he actually kill him? Did Saul die? And he claimed it. That's not what we're talking about this morning. But he runs up to David and says, hey, hey, I killed Saul for you. I did your dirty work. Aren't you proud of me? Don't kill me. And David says, how is it that you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Guess what we would translate that word? To destroy the Lord's Messiah. It's the same word, Messiah. Or, if you were a Greek, how dare you set your hand to destroy the Lord's Christ? So this term is a title that can be used for many people. Okay? But what makes Jesus' title so significant? Let's get into that. Turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is kind of the beginning of where we're kind of getting a distinct figure from a specific lineage that's going to have a specific title. You got some stuff in Genesis, right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. You got some stuff in Moses that there would be a prophet who would come, right? But there's, there's, they're more vague. This is where we're really starting to kind of condense what is the role of this singular Messiah and who would he come from, okay? So in 2 Samuel, well, we're going to skip all those for a second. 2 Samuel chapter 7, I put them out of order, I'm sorry. Verse 12, this is, um, this is David coming to God and says, God, I want to build you a temple. I want to build you a house. And this is the Lord's response to that. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will, <clears throat> I will raise up for an offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I shall discipline him with a rod of man and with the stripes of the son of men. My steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision Nathan spoke of David. So, we also have to remember that prophecy is not, is not always linear. What I mean by linear is a lot of times we come to this and the first person who we think of is whom? It's got to be Jesus. The first person who we're talking about is actually David's son. David's son. Solomon. Wow. Nebuchadnezzar was running through my head. All right. There you go. Not every, my, my wife was just saying, son's, your son's got a memory like you. Obviously not. <laughs> Solomon first portion he's talking to is Solomon because Solomon would be the one who was going to build the temple of God and initially God designed I'm, I'm glad you guys know more than me God designed this temple to in this kingdom to be built and established forever but as you read your Bibles what do you understand about Solomon and his temple and his kingdom it falls short right and so turn with me to Psalm 89, because this psalm is a psalm recognizing the fact that the promise made to Solomon, the son of David, did not happen, did not occur. Okay, so go to Psalm 89. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 1. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever with my mouth. I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens, and you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant, 
that I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. This is a psalm recognizing that God made a promise to, to David, but it's not what? It's not in fulfillment. So we are still waiting for that prophecy in 2 Samuel to still be fulfilled. Jump down to verse 20. He says, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. I have made him Messiah. And this is why they're waiting for an anointed line of David. Jump down to verse 27. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him, and I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of heaven. So we're waiting for David's son, who would sit on his throne forever. God would anoint him and would make a covenant with him, and all who are under that covenant blessing will be in his kingdom. Now jump over to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. We're going to make some connections. Here's an interesting thing we're going to see here. Because not only was a king anointed, there was also a priest who was anointed. And for an Israel, an Israelite, you can't have a kingdom. Yeah, you can establish a kingdom, but you still need a priesthood, don't you? And so there were many Jews who were, not, who were waiting for two messiahs. They were waiting for a messiah who was a king, and they were also waiting for a messiah coming from the lineage of Aaron. By the, by the way, the book of Hebrews is actually an answer to a lot of those types of, well, how can Jesus be both priest and king? He's not from the line of Aaron. Go read the book of Hebrews, Okay. But you get a lot of that from actually this passage right here. We'll see this. Look at verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So this goes back to Genesis 49. But also David is from the line of Judah. Verse 15. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from, for David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For the Lord says, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And, look at verse 18, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in the presence to offer burnt offerings to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. That's why they believed, hey, we're going to have to have a king Messiah anointed, and we're also going to have to have a Messiah from the priests of Aaron, okay? Because a, a person from Judah cannot both be from Judah, sit on the throne, and claim his right as a Levite and be a high priest. Jesus answers both of those. Turn to Ezekiel 37. And this is our last one, then we're going to kind of jump into how we're going to bring all this together. Ezekiel 37. Right after the Valley of Dry Bones um, illustration that we see, look at verse 24. My servant David. By the way, all of these passages that we've now been talking about, David's been dead for hundreds of years. So we're obviously not talking about David. We're talking about the promise that God made to David that his anointed son would sit on his throne. Okay? My servant David shall be king over them. They shall have all one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statues. They shall dwell in the land that I give to my servant Jacob where your fathers lived they and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever, and David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. 
when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Now, if you look at that word sanctuary, it's a, it's a derivative of the word presence. My presence. I will, when I establish this Messiah figure who will sit on the throne of David, my sanctuary will be with you forever. So we've got this king who's acting as priest, who's also bringing the presence of God with him. Now, when you start bringing this all together and Jesus comes, especially in John chapter 1, what's one of the first things we know about Jesus? First, he was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we've got God himself coming and dwelling, making his tabernacle among us. Now, let's look at John chapter 1 in the first disciples. In the very first disciples. This is the only two places in all of Scripture where we actually have the word Messiah, the Greek word Messias. <clears throat> but we're going to bring all these terms together. And what does that mean for us? So John 1, John has introduced Jesus. Jesus has come and has just been baptized by John. Behold, here is the Lamb of God. John's disciples are now looking to leave John to go find whom? To go find the Messiah, the one who John has just declared in front of the entire world. So look at verse 35. The next day, again, John was standing with his two disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and he's walked, as he walked by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Then the two disciples heard him and say, Then they follow Jesus. Right? John was to prepare the way for Jesus, so naturally John's disciples should become disciples of whom? Of Jesus. Why? Jesus turned and saw them following and said, What are you seeking? What are you seeking? They don't even answer that question. They, ask, they answer a question with a question. They'd be very good disciples of Jesus. And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So they're recognizing him as a teacher. And back then, a rabbi is somebody who you would go and live with, basically. You would go and spend all your time. You would w not just learn under them in a Bible class for an hour. You would watch how they lived and interacted because their teachings would not just be something they did from a pulpit. It'd be something they also lived out. And so disciples would not just hear it said. They would watch it be said. And so they're coming to, do you have a place to say, Jesus, because we're here with you. All right. And he said, come and you will see. So they, they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And so he first found his brother, Simon, and said, we have found the Messiah which means the Christ. So if you're looking at the Greek, we have found the Messiahs, which means Christos. We have found the anointed one. He brought them to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, look at verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said, follow me. Then Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And that's a play on words with Jacob's name. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, said, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree, and I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. There are more titles found of Jesus in this section than in any other place. And guess what? They all come and have their heading under Messiah. 
That's why we can equate Messiah with salvation. We can equate Messiah with comfort. We can equate Messiah with all these different things. But ultimately, the term Messiah, the anointed one they were looking for, was from the lineage of David who would sit on the throne of David and be king over all of Israel. And Jesus then says, verse 50, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Ultimately, what we're going to be looking at, not this week, but in a couple weeks, we're going to be looking at how does Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection announce him as king. All right, the purpose of the death, burial, and resurrection, there's a lot of them, but one of them, the fact that he was raised and ascended to the right hand of God, puts him as the anointed one. Because if Jesus came and made all those claims, fulfilled every prophecy, and yet never rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God, he could not claim the anointed one of God. All his other work that he did, all of it else would be for naught if he does not reign and rule. So when we go back to Acts, all those verses I had in Acts, what is that they kept preaching? The term over and over and over again, I only brought up seven of them. There are 39 times in the book of Acts they preach Jesus as the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Christ is Jesus. All those different variations... What do they mean by that? They mean Jesus the King. Jesus the King. It may even be helpful for us because we don't really understand the word Christ. Or even if we said anointed one, it probably wouldn't help us that much. It was the same term as Jesus the King. Now, oh, I didn't turn my... Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. We're going to end here. Verse 13. Jesus came into the district, the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? That's another title from Ezekiel. I mean, just, there's so many we could, we could be exploring today. And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to him, but who do you say that I am? Now, funny thing is, every single one of those people that we just brought up, they were all anointed ones. They were all messiahs. But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the messiah. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one, the son of the living God, the Lord's anointed, not just by proxy, not just by prophet, but you are literally the indwelling of God above come down into flesh to be the anointed of God and to bring about your kingdom. That's what that statement declares. When you go around and you tell people, I believe that Jesus Christ is the king, or when I believe, that Jesus, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe Jesus is the Christ, you are announcing, I believe that Jesus reigns and rules in the kingdom of men, and that he has established his kingdom, he is sitting on the, lineage of, on the throne of David, and he is sitting at the right hand of God, and he reigns all authority, under heaven and earth has been given to him. That's what you are declaring. And Jesus even confirms that by this. He says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, on this statement, I will build my ecclesia, my people, my church, my kingdom. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been bound, loosed in heaven. And he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. 
They're figuring it out. They're starting to get it. They don't fully grasp it because, once again, what does Peter do as Jesus is being led to the cross? He betrays him three times because he fully doesn't understand. And what we're going to look at, the resurrection of Jesus in the ascension, really, Acts chapter 1, seals the deal where Jesus unleashes the kingdom and no longer is he telling people to keep it quiet. Throughout the book of Acts, the thing they're announcing, who, whose name are you speaking? We are speaking in the name of Jesus the Christ. He is the anointed one of God. And I'm going to ask you this question. What should our message be? Salvation is a good message because everybody feels it. Forgiveness of sins is a good message. But I'm going to stress this here. That is a, that is a result of Jesus being the king. The gospel message is Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is king of David. And because he's king, he offers salvation. Because he's king, he can grant forgiveness. Because he's king, he can transfer you from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. But salvation is not the end-all, be-all. Salvation just allows you, having your sins forgiven, allows you to dwell in the presence of this king, be a citizen of this king. And so when we only focus on, and one of the reasons I'm going to say it, when we only focus on forgiveness, everybody wants that. Everybody wants their sins forgiven. Everybody, if they can, well, not everybody, I shouldn't say that. Most people understand that they have a need for forgiveness. But the message needs to be, it's not just that Jesus is saving you. He is your king. He is your Christ. And therefore, he's saving you for a purpose. He's saving you for a reason. There is something that he is transferring you into, and now you can live a true and meaningful life in the kingdom of God. And so this morning I ask, if you're not a Christian, Jesus this morning, he reigns and rules in his kingdom whether you are saved or not. Believe it or not, the gospel is not about you. The gospel is about Jesus. And when we hear that there is a king who's on his throne, we need to understand, well, if he has all rule and power and authority, who do I need to submit myself to? The king. But Colossians will tell us in the same, and we're going to get there again. I'm kind of giving hints of all these lessons that we're going to be coming up with. All things were made by him, through him, and for him. We are not the center of this book. Jesus is the center of the book. All we have to determine is do we want to be in Christ and with him or outside of Christ? Because his kingdom is reigning and ruling without us. His kingdom would reign and rule if nobody joined. And the gospel would still be Jesus is the king. It's for him, by him, and through him. Do you want to be a part of that? To do that, though, you have to have your sins forgiven. You have to, right? The, it's a means to an end. Salvation is a means so that you can be member in this kingdom. You cannot be a member in this kingdom and still be enslaved to sin. You can't be, right? And so sin enslaves you. Jesus died and offered his blood so that you can be cleansed from that. And he was risen from the dead. So not you just, just remain dead but you can be buried with him in baptism to rise and walk in newness of life with a new king and a new purpose in a new kingdom. If that's what you desire, that's what Jesus offers. That's what's on the table this morning for you and for all who would believe. Maybe you're a Christian this morning, and I think our message needs to be you see this world? Who do people assume is in control of this world? If they're a believer at all. Right? 
got to be some evil force out there. There's, look at, I mean, look at the world around us. Or maybe they're not a Christian. They're like, man, our president, or man, this king, or man, this guy, or man, these nations. They don't know what's going on. It's going into chaos. I don't like the way the world's going. There is someone who's in, who's in control. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But through this book, you can understand that these things have happened before. The world has looked like this before. And guess what God always does? He reigns and he rules. Those kingdoms are gone. Guess which kingdom's still here? The kingdom of God. And guess which kingdom will be here to the very end of days and beyond? This same kingdom. Where's our priorities? In the kingdom of men or in the kingdom of heaven? This morning, if there's any need that you have, we ask that you come forward as we stand together and sing.